Okay, folks, this is Todd Coburn, Lecture 16, Cal Poly Pomona's Arrow 3271. Today, we're going to look at fatigue analysis of welds. We're going to look at two methods, <clears throat> one quite similar to what we've done in the past, and one completely different and much quicker. Here's how it goes. We're going to call this method one. The method that follows what we learned initially about fatigue is going to be called method one. So if we want to utilize the tools we've already learned about analyzing fatigue, we will start by characterizing our stresses. We'll figure out what the maximum and the minimum loads are, and we'll calculate the maximum and minimum shear stresses in the weld. Of course, these could also be normal stresses, and we would calculate them the same way. But since most of our welds will be fillet welds, which means we're going to be pretending that that's a shear stress. Now what we see here are shear stresses. And it's true that if we do have a butt weld, we also can use the same approach for normal stresses. However, since many of the welds that we are going to see will be fillet welds, and we're idealizing fillet welds as being carrying only shear stresses, this is how we would do that. Now you'll notice we have no stress concentration factor shown here on those stresses, and that's because we're only going to apply the stress concentration factor to the alternating component of the shear stress. Here are some typical stress concentration factors for welds. The first one is for a reinforced butt weld. That means if we find a butt weld, this is the stress concentration factor we will use. <clears throat> the next one is for the toe of a transverse fillet weld. If you look at the side of a fillet weld, it looks like a little triangle. And if you look at the small end of that triangle, it looks like a little arch and the toe of a foot. If you look at that little spot where the toe is, that would be the spot where we would apply that 1.5 stress concentration factor. When we say the end of a parallel fillet weld, what that means is if we have a fillet weld and if our shear stress is acting parallel to the weld itself, we're going to tend to get a stress concentration factor at the end of that weld and that's where this stress concentration factor applies. If we have a T-butt joint with sharp corners, that would mean we have like a T-weld and our stress acts perpendicular to that fillet weld. Then we have a factor or uh, stress concentration factor of two. So these are the stress concentration factors we would use. We would apply them only to the alternating component of the shear stress. Once we have that, we would then calculate our endurance limit and our allowable stress. We can estimate our allowable shear stress by taking 67% of the FTU if we don't have an FSU for the material itself. We then can use modified Goodman or some other criterion to evaluate our factor of safety for infinite life and evaluate as before. So the first thing we're going to need to do is estimate the endurance limit. We're going to estimate S sub E prime as we did before from FTU. And uh, then we're going to convert the S sub E prime into a endurance limit for shear, a non-pristine endurance limit for shear. And the way we're going to do that is through our Marin factors. These Marin factors are not only going to take the endurance limit from a pristine value to a non-pristine value, but they will also turn it from a tension value into a shear value. Okay, so for welds, we're going to find, uh, we're going to still use the surface condition factor. And what we're going to do is use the as-forge condition for all welds, which means we're using these two coefficients. So it's slightly easier because we have no judgment, we're just using the as-forged condition for all welds. 
and in the heat affected zone. For the size factor, we're going to go ahead and use 1. For the load factor, we're going to use 0.59. That actually is what's going to convert this from a tension value to a shear value. If we have a temperature, we'll use the temperature factor in the same way, and the reliability, we use the same kind of reliability factor we used before. So that means we're going to have two values. One of them is a function of FTU, and the other one is a value that just converts to torsion. And then the other factors will all be one, except for temperature and or reliability, depending on the problem statement. Therefore, we could write our endurance limit this way. We're going to take the pristine value, S of E prime, multiply by 0.59 in the three uh, Marin factors, Ka, Kd, and Ke. Now we're going to use the same approach where we uh, have the endurance limit where we have the fatigue strength as a function of the number of cycles. And this time we're going to start with FSU as our intercept and going to our SSE. FSU is going to be our first one at, 10 to the, at n equals 10 to the 0. And if we don't know what it is, we'll assume that FSU is 67% of FTU. Our inflection point will be at FFSU, and we will use Shigley's fatigue fraction. Once again, rather than reading the curve, we will use that uh, equation based on FTU that I gave you guys. And at a million cycles, we're going to put SSE. That means that what we're going to have is A and B coefficients, and our uh, relations will be the same as we did before. We've got an intercept, A, and a B slope. These are our two key relations, and our coefficients are here. We've got the low cycle fatigue coefficients and our high cycle fatigue coefficients. This approach will enable us to calculate marginals of safety against infinite life and the actual life using the same approach we did before. So you've already seen this little comment up at the top. Our fully reverse shear fatigue strength is SSF, and our fully reverse fatigue stress is going to be tau rev. So then we can estimate our infinite life margin of safety using these equations. You'll notice these are nearly identical to what we had before, but now they've been altered. So we've got the shear endurance limit and the shear strength. We have tau A and tau M all throughout this. Okay. Once again, our, uh, the tau A should include the stress concentration factor if there is one. If we then get a negative margin of safety, we can calculate the actual life by first calculating the fully reversed shear stress and then calculating Method number two is going to be completely different, and here's how it works. This is uh, developed in Norton's text, and also it's the American Society of Welds method. If you look at this chart, what we're seeing here is the range stress, or the change in stress, as a function of the cycles to failure. And... Uh, we also see that what we have here is the uh, stress ratio, the min to the max stress is shown. Now let's focus on the upper curve first. See all these symbols that are hollow? This is all for unwelded samples. Since we're characterizing this relative to the stress ratio, the, stre the min or the max stress, you'll notice if our R is zero, what that means is we have a repeated stress, right? So if our min stress is zero and our max stress is something positive, then R will always be zero. And if R is zero, that means we have a repeated stress. So that is the diamonds. The diamonds all represent repeated stress. If R is minus one, we have a completely reverse stress. That means when the min and the max stress are the same, but the min stress is the negative of the max stress. That is the little squares. And if we have anything else for a ratio of one quarter, that means the min stress is one quarter of the max stress. That's shown up in the upper right. 
you'll notice one thing. It, these three types of stress represented by these three stress ratios in when the stress ratio is one quarter and the stress ratio is zero, both of these mean that we have some mean stress and we have an alternating stress. When R equals minus one, that means we only have alternating stress as the mean stress is zero. If we now look at the figure, the one, the squares that are shown here, the hollow squares are for parts that are not welded. If we look at, say, a certain number of cycles like 10 to the sixth, we see the parts with no mean stress have a higher stress allowable than the ones with a mean stress. If we look at the other curve, all these solid symbols, we find a different trend. So when we look at the unwelded part, we see there's a difference between parts that have a mean stress and those that have a no mean stress. For the parts that are welded, we'll notice that basically those three symbols, it's kind of like scatter. You can't see a definite trend between the parts, the welds that have mean stress and those that don't. Now the reason this is important is this leads researchers to conclude that the mean stress does not affect the fatigue strength of a welded part in the same way that it does for a non-welded part. In fact, it seems that the mean stress hardly affects the fatigue life for a welded part, while it does affect the fatigue life for a non-welded part. And this is why we're only applying the stress concentration factor to uh, one component, the alternating component. And this is why method two is can use a completely different approach that completely ignores any mean stress on the part and only uses the alternating part of the stress to characterize the fatigue strength. We could write the factor of safety or the margin of safety directly on fatigue strength. So this slide, uh, actually, the weld code lays out a, different, a bunch of different parts and characterizes different types of welds. Now, there's actually a lot of uh, information here and a lot of uh, study that we could do to actually understand all the different kinds of welds we might see. But basically, what we're going to do is characterize these in two brackets. Those where the weld experiences shear and those where it experiences normal stresses. Okay, folks. So method two, these graphs help to uh, illustrate method two. And if we look at the lowermost chart, we will see the vertical axis shows the range stress. It shows the range stress either for a normal stress, which is calling S sub F. R for range, and S sub F R S for range shear stress. If we have a normal stress, this means we calculate the range stress, which means the maximum stress minus the minimum stress, and compare it to this chart. You'll notice this chart, rather than starting at 10 to the 0 or 10 to the 3, or even 10 to the, uh, 10 to the 6, what this shows is 10 to the 5 onward. So it really shows that the upper side of, of, of uh, high cycle fatigue. And what we see is we could compare our range stress against this allowable range stress. And if we're underneath the curve, we're good. If we have a category F uh, weld, which means a weld loaded in shear, like a fillet weld, we'll see that instead what we have on the vertical axis is the shear range stress, which means the maximum shear stress minus the minimum shear stress. And if we compare that to this line, this curve, we can determine whether or not that's acceptable or not acceptable. So we're going to use these two equations, which are analogous to the Paris equation. This tells us what the allowable range stress is for a normal stress or a shear stress. And all we need are the coefficients. The coefficients are given here. We see we have C sub F and S sub ER. S sub ER means that's the endurance limit. But where before the endurance limit was compared 
to a alternating stress. In this case, it now is that range stress. So if we have a normal stress, we can expect the range stress to be good up to 24 KSI. And if we have a shear, uh, well loaded in shear, then we can expect the range stress to be good up to 8 KSI. And we see the coefficient C sub F to the left. So for an A weld, it would be 250 times 10 to the 8th. And for a F weld, 150 times 10 e to the 10th. If we have a weld loaded in shear, we will use category F. If we have a weld loaded in shear, we'll use category F as shown here. A weld loaded in normal, normal loaded like a butt weld would be, we're going to use category A. As long as the range stress for a Normal loaded weld is less than 24 KSI, we're acceptable as long as the shear stress is lower than 8 KSI, we're acceptable. If the values get higher than that, we can calculate the life. Now to use this equation, we also need the reliability factor, which is shown here. The reliability factor, you'll notice here, this is different than before. When we first studied fatigue, we saw a reliability factor of 1 was associated with a 50% reliability. But for welds, because of the conservatism in the analysis, a reliability factor of one is associated with a 95% reliability. And other values are shown here. So, to use this equation, we will insert the reliability value that we need from this table on the upper left. We'll insert the coefficient C sub F from this table up in the middle. And we will use that to compare up to the endurance limit. Now this works to calculate the fatigue strength or the range allowable stress for a given number of cycles. If we want to use the actual range stress to evaluate the number of cycles we're good for, we will use these two forms of the equation. Once again, it's important to note that the stress that we're going to insert here is not the alternating component like we have in all other fatigue analysis, including welds using method one. If we're using method two, we're going to put the range stress values in there, the maximum minus the minimum values. This is very important. That's how we deal with welds. Enjoy.